think I speak for the majority of his audience when I say that. I don't think anybody was agreeing with or forming their opinions based on the racial things he would say or the edgy comedy. I'm sure there's a minority of people out there who tuned in specifically for that. But the majority of us tuned in because he's just an entertaining dude. He's so entertaining. None of your videos came from a place of hate. At least I don't think so. I I don't think you were ever a racist or, or a bigot or anything like that. You used those words for shock humor. Uh, that was the whole goal. The edgy shock humor of using those words. And you made it pretty clear that that was kind of your drive. And he does mention it in this video with the it's either all okay or none of it's okay mentality. But I really think most people were able to recognize that the things he was saying weren't coming from a place of legitimate hate. It's still, I think, a little ridiculous to make it seem like it was this big of a deal that it warranted a whole apology video in which he makes it seem like he'll never truly find forgiveness and he'll never forgive himself. I think racism is bad. I think a lot of this kind of stuff is bad. Now, racial humor, edgy humor has a place, right? Like obviously plenty of comics and plenty of writers do it successfully. Now, the reason why I'm saying like iDubs isn't as bad as David Duke or some actual racist on the internet is those kind of people exist. At the end of the day, all right, Ian, I don't think he was a racist throughout his entire endeavor. And I think a lot of those content cops do hold up in terms of their critiques to some of these individuals. They'll stress, I don't think these jokes are as bad as like some real legitimate racist that still exist on the internet on a lot of alternative platforms. Hello everyone, once again, from the Tory dystopia of the United Kingdom. Don't worry, I haven't moved countries again. I'm just staying at my girlfriend's for the week. You might be wondering, when am I gonna respond to the Hassan drama? Me and Hassan are in a massive feud at the moment. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's reacting to our drama. I might be talking about that maybe Friday this week, so stay tuned for that. But today, we aren't talking about leftist infighting. We are talking about centrism. And I guess the rise of centrist YouTubers, centrist bro YouTubers. They are, you know, all men in this case. And it's something I've been noticing recently in that, like, with the end of like the anti-feminist, anti-SJW wave, with a lot of people on YouTube and a lot of the creators of that wave, like iDubs, who we spoke about recently, with those people kind of going away, the people who were kind of in that community split into two groups. You either have people who went like full on right wing, like the quartering, for example, or you have people who I'm going to talk about today. You have Boogie, you have Critical, you have Ordinary Gamer. These people aren't right wing, but they're not left wing either. They are centrist. And why I chose these three is I think they reflect the spectrum of YouTuber centrism. So we have someone like Boogie, who clearly is a centrist just because he wants to pander to as many people as possible, just wants to please all sides. Despite some of the terrible things he said, I actually feel pretty bad for this guy because it feels like his centrism comes from a place of not having much self-esteem rather than being some like crazy grifter, although that might play into it. Then we have someone like Ordinary Gamer, and I'm gonna call this guy the ideological centrist because I believe out of these three people we're talking about today, he actually believes centrism. He believes in what he's saying. And also out of the three of them, I feel like he's the most principled in that when he is giving this centrist position, I at least know he believes it. And then we're gonna also be talking about Moist Critical, and I call this type of centrism just the pandering centrism. This guy wants to be uncontroversial. This guy wants to pander to as many people as possible. That's why he's become so big in the first place. And what you're gonna see of all of these people is that although they are centrists, like many centrists do, they'll acknowledge the opposition argument, mainly from the left, but they will always side with the right, and they will only basically cover issues from a right-wing framing. As we're going to see, how many times have you seen these people defend Mr. Beast from criticism from the left? But when conservatives are going after Mr. Beast because his co-host is trans, it's basically crickets from these three. They haven't said anything about it. You think they would, they talk about everything. They take the moral high ground on so many different things. But when it comes to something like that, oh, I guess people who make like a video every day didn't have time to cover one of the biggest issues on the internet that week or that month, you might be thinking these people can make what videos they want. Why I think they're worthy of criticism is because these people take moral position. They position themselves as moral people. They will criticize people like Logan Paul. Oh, what a scammer. They'll criticize people like Sneeko. What a cuck. But they always criticize people they know their audience will hate. 
and they will not criticize people they know their audience will like. And in that way, you could predict their take on so many things because you know what they're gonna say before they say it. They're gonna say something that is uncontroversial. They're gonna say something that panders to as many people as possible. They're going to stay out of saying something that could make them lose money, sponsorship, subscribers. And that just ends up with these people often having like really shit takes while at the same time, a lot of people praising them as like reasonable. Like really their morality is bog standard morality. Like scamming people is bad. Harassing people is bad. Being someone who's crazy and hates women like Sneeko, yeah, that's bad. But when it comes to an issue with more nuance, like how should we feel about Mr. Beast content? How should we feel about the Hogwarts legacy boycott? How should we feel about iDubs saying that he hates his old content? Then you can always guarantee these people are going to have a shit take because they don't engage in nuance or they engage in the issue and remove a lot of context from it, or they don't really know what they're talking about. So it's just like a such a surface level take. And most of the time their audience agree with them, but I will give credit to Critical's audience lately in that they've been calling him out a lot for his iDubs take. So we're gonna cover all of this today. We're gonna use a few different case studies just to highlight how these people are centrist, but also how they differ, because although you're gonna be watching a lot of their takes and thinking like, these are literally the same takes they're all having together, I think, like I said, there is some nuance between them in that one I feel like is a centrist out of having no self-esteem, one is a firm ideological centrist who I probably respect more than the others, and one is just pandering and doesn't want to get into any controversy. So before we get any further, just the usual stuff, like the video in the comments, let me know who is the worst centrist YouTuber, doesn't have to be the three I've just mentioned, and also follow me on social media at The Cavernacle on Twitter, but also on Instagram. Consider becoming a patron for exclusive content and also getting access to the Discord server and my Switch friend code. Trying to build up as many $1 to $3 patrons as possible, so go check that out. And also check out my subreddit and my second channel down in the description. So I think to start off, we should look at the iDubs apology and these freeze response to the apology. So for those of you who somehow don't know, iDubs was a really edgy YouTube comedian back in like 2016 to like 2020 made a habit out of saying like racial slurs made a habit out of doing like racial caricatures of different ethnic groups and also just saying like really outrageous stuff lots of people at the time did criticize him but back then youtube was a hive mind and you could be really really racist and if you started speaking out against racism you'd usually get dogpiled. Like I said in my video about iDubs, people like John Tron saying like the most racist far-right stuff and everyone just downplaying it, saying we're all too sensitive. iDubs saying all this stuff constantly. Again, people saying you're so sensitive, it's just freedom of speech, all this stuff. Not realizing that they were part of an extremely toxic community where there actually were a load of racists and iDubs was actually galvanizing racist people with him basically saying slurs are okay. And in the last video, I basically showed you loads of comments saying like I was bullied in school as a black person because loads of people I know watched iDubs and they would just say the N word to me all the time. And I got really badly bullied because these people all liked his content. I'm gonna focus on this the least, but of course I talked about Critical's video on this where he got called out a lot. And basically his take was, you know, there was no racist intent behind his words. So therefore he wasn't racist. And also it was just 2016. 2016 was a different time. 2016, it was perfectly okay to just say racial slurs on YouTube and have it not be controversial. Basically Critical was saying that everything he did wasn't done with malice and hatred. And most people weren't influenced by him. Like no one would take what iDubs was saying seriously and use that as a justification to start saying slurs or to actually be racist. And then Critical responded to the criticism he got basically by double downing and saying, yeah, it was 2016. The next biggest thing by far is me saying that I don't think the apology was warranted. Uh, warrant maybe wasn't the right word since that's the one a lot of people are really like underlining and highlighting and giving me an F on the book report for. So to explain what I meant, when I'm saying I don't think the apology was warranted, I'm saying I don't think him being a product of edgy internet culture is necessarily something that should have been weighing on his mind so heavily for the last seven years that he's lived with this constant guilt, this burden on his shoulders where he's feeling as though he created edgy internet culture. And I, I feel as though the content he used to make did have a message. He wasn't coming from a place of genuine hatefulness. I don't think he was ever like a real racist or an actual bigot. So when I said I don't think the apologies warranted, what I mean is I don't think what he did was so damaging and scarring to 
the online space or individuals that for seven years he's needed to carry this guilt where he felt obligated to finally apologize for it. But I think most people knew he wasn't like this evil racist person. So I, what I was saying is I just don't think what he did gave a ton of people the impression that he really was a horrible, racist, bigoted person. Now, I do want to explain, I still do believe that iDubbbz was never a bad person for the content cops he made. That edgy, shock humor was very much a 2016 trend. That whole era with slurs being used willy-nilly for cheap shock humor was not uncommon on the internet. Now, to be fair to him, he did say there's nothing wrong with iDubbbz apologizing. He's basically saying iDubbbz shouldn't have apologized, and why did he have to do this? Just change silently, move on with your life, you don't have to say sorry for this stuff, because even if it's cringe and embarrassing what you did, it's not the end of the world. But thankfully, like I said, a lot of people called him out, and yeah, loads of people saying it was a terrible take, because it was, because this guy wasn't affected by it, and who is he to say what is racist and what is not, especially in regard to someone like literally being extremely racist on YouTube videos and making loads of money off that content. I honestly think Critical miscalculated here. I think he thinks his audience would all agree with him. And that's why he had to make a follow-up video because he realized that everyone was hating on him. So he shares a lot of similarities with Centrist in that they all say, you know, if he thinks that's cringe and he wants to, you know, move away from that content, that's good but no need to apologize. And then in that regard, we also have Boogie, who started saying a lot of stuff on Twitter, deleted it, but then made a video basically saying the same stuff. So in regards to iDubbbz, um, he posted a screenshot after it just went live saying, you all think the beating Geordie gave me was bad. Check out the beating iDubbbz is giving his career. Watching this video, I feel so bad for this guy. He has lost all self-confidence. He has lost all self-respect. He is losing his audience. He is losing his career. I walked a similar path and I hated the results. I hope he gets better. And then um, he posted on Ian's actual video. I doubt you care what I have to say, but I missed the old iDubs. That was carefree and fun. I don't care about the language or negativity. I never did. Well, of course you wouldn't. You're just like a white YouTuber who's also said a load of terrible stuff. Like, why would you care that what he did? I liked it when you were having fun. Pickles and storm drains, squirrel cams, full force. Please find the fun in your life and share it with us. And then he wrote, I deleted most of the tweets about iDubs. People took it the wrong way, I guess. I don't think people took it the wrong way. I still think apology videos are dumb from personal experience. It's better to show the growth than to tell people about it. Now, obviously, like, you know, hating on iDubs, very popular, pandering, it seems as well. But having the centrist element of, you know, don't apologize, just move on. Like, you don't really, it wasn't really that bad. I personally didn't actually mind you saying all those racial slurs as a fellow white person. But now let's get on to his actual video and just discuss, you know, what he said. It's pretty similar, but he just elaborates a bit more. I personally have watched iDubs forever. Content Cop, I actually really enjoyed. For the most part, I, I like most of what Ian did. I know edgy comedy. I like edgy comedy. I still consume edgy comedy to this day. Sometimes I'll watch Dave Chappelle. And when I was watching iDubs back in the old days, I, I had grown out of that sense of humor for the most part. I wasn't really about it. I didn't like it when Ian did it, but I liked the rest of what Ian was doing. And I'm mature enough and I understand comedy enough to where I could overlook the things he did that I didn't like, right? The same way I overlook Dave Chappelle's opinions I disagree with. Or, and I was able to look past the things I didn't like about iDubs at the time to enjoy those things. And I think I speak for the majority of his audience when I say that. I don't think anybody was agreeing with or forming their opinions based on the racial things he would say or the edgy comedy. I'm sure there's a minority of people out there who tuned in specifically for that. But the majority of us tuned in because he's just an entertaining dude. Look, I don't agree with Ian that a lot of the things he said and did were bigoted and not great. And I have no problem with him looking back on that and cringing and wanting to grow up. By the time you're 30 years old, if you don't look back at the things that you did when you were 20 and cringe, you probably haven't developed very much. So I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with is the fact that I think Ian is under the impression that the reason we were tuning in was for the bigotry. That we were tuning in because he was a bigot or a racist. I was tuning in 
regardless of that stuff. So are you starting to already see my problem with centrist YouTubers? What Boogie was saying there was pretty much the same as what Critical was saying, apart from Boogie's audience is pretty tiny now, so no one really actually cares what he's saying, but he's pretty much saying the same thing. Like, you know, it's perfectly okay to look back at your younger self and feel cringy about it, but most people who watched your content saying racial slurs weren't influenced by you. Most people weren't tuning in because you said that. But how will this guy know? And also, just like with Critical, this apology is not for Boogie. It's not for Critical. It's literally for the people who actually suffered abuse because they were fans of iDubs and they'd go out and say this stuff to gay people and to black people. Like, Boogie and Critical do not understand. This apology isn't iDubs coming over to them and being like, I am so sorry, please forgive me, other white centrist reactionary YouTubers, no. And that is just like the amazing centrist brain these guys have. Is This is why I just find centrist so like dull and boring. Like I would literally rather both of them come out and just, you know, say the right wing version of what they're saying. Don't even put the caveats in of like, the slurs were bad and racism is bad. Just come out and say you like those old videos and you didn't care about this because you're all racist as well. I guess this pandering does work for the right wing because they can just project what they want on these centrists. And I think that's what people often do. And that's why these people have right wing fan bases often because if Critical says that iDubs doesn't have to apologize, even though he might say other things about like the racism being bad and stuff, then a right wing person who is like racist, reactionary, they'll just project their own values on Critical and him and Boogie offer that blank slate for people. Because also, you know, they're not principled in their positions. You know, they are just saying stuff and giving both sides of the argument so their millions of followers can just, you know, not really care what they think because they're not taking a firm stance on anything. So Moist Critical and Boogie are similar in that, like I said, I think a lot of their centrism is brought on by like other things. I don't think it's brought on by their ideological positions. I think it's pandering, self-esteem, try to appeal to as many people as possible. And some of you guys might say that's fair enough, but I would say to these people, if you wanna do that, why are you just slinging out takes on like everything which could be controversial and political but like i said we have one more person in the centrist gang who i respect a tiny bit more because it feels like he's just like some centrist libertarian and he's actually ideologically a libertarian as well i don't think he's as bad as the other two but i find this video pretty interesting because it seems like he gave his take and then he watched it back and then there are segments of this video with mirror's edge gameplay I'm assuming he didn't just think Mirror's Edge was entertaining and put it in there. I'm assuming he put it in afterwards so he could start adding caveats into his argument to make sure he didn't really fall one way or the other. So I'm just going to play you like a couple minutes of this as well. So Ordinary Gamer, so about the iDubs apology video. I was pretty invested in this entire community back during its heyday. Now, obviously, iDubs is a pretty big inspiration for some of the content that I've produced on this channel, especially when it comes to commentaries and critiquing individuals, but iDubs is part of a larger group of content creators, you know, your Filthy Franks, your H3H3, your uh, Max Mofo, your Anything for Views. These guys collaborated together, and they produce some of the funniest content, but also some of the edgiest content, and he grew up, okay? Generally, when you get past 30, okay? Having your, you know, edgy Discord jokes don't really fly anymore. You grow out of it. And I think a lot of it is due to the fact that as he gets older, as he develops a new friend circle or goes out and meets friends, he changes. I think racism is bad. I think a lot of this kind of stuff is bad. I think, you know, people without ever having a joke is bad. Now, racial humor, edgy humor has a place, right? Like obviously plenty of comics and plenty of writers do it successfully. Now, the reason why I'm saying like iDubs isn't as bad as David Duke or some actual racist on the internet is those kind of people exist. At the end of the day, all right, Ian, I don't think he was a racist piece throughout his entire endeavor. And I think a lot of those content cops do hold up in terms of their critiques to some of these individuals. But that also being said, if you're going to sit there and say that this kind, these kind of jokes never had any impact or harm, you kind of have to like really look at it critically, okay? It's a bit disingenuous to say that. But also, could, these, are, these are wild jokes. I also, again, will stress, I don't think these jokes are as bad as like some real legitimate racist that still exist on the internet on a lot of alternative platforms. And in some cases, right here on YouTube, okay? It's a wild world. Ian was a guy that used shock humor. And I think he regrets using that shock humor because he ultimately did cost some sleep for a lot of his, uh, you know, minority fans back in the day. I guess he's, is where this apology is leading to. So I'll give credit to Ordinary Gamer. If you go and watch like the 20 minute video, 
he is better than the other two on this subject, but what I've just shown you, hopefully, is pretty much the same as what the other two have said as well, is that, yeah, what he said was bad, slurs are bad, but let's not pretend he was a massive racist, and it's good he's changed, he's good he's changed, but, and he probably did hurt a minority of people with his content, but he's really made himself out to be worse than what he is, that's what this all boils down to, right? And I think Ordinary Gamer said something really important at the start of his video. He said he used to be kind of like into this content as well. And I think all of these people were into this content. So when iDubbbz comes out and says, yeah, this content was not okay. This really created a toxic environment online and had real world consequences of people being racist and taking my videos as basically a pass to start saying these things. These three people watch that and they're like, oh, oh damn, like he's he's admitting this. The guy who made the videos is, and I like those videos. I might have even been inspired by iDubbbz who I'm a creator. So he's not just saying stuff about himself now. He's saying stuff about me as well. He's basically saying that, well, the people who like that, who are bad as well. Like I was bad for doing it. And the people who liked it and took it as permission to start saying these things, you were bad. So I think with all these three people, while they're also being centrist, I think they're getting pretty defensive because they feel like they're being called out by iDubs. And they're giving like this kind of like mealy mouthed centrist take because it kind of like absolves them as well. Because it's like, well, I don't think iDubs was a racist because if I do admit that, then I have to admit my past self like racist content. And I'm not going to do that, obviously. But at the same time, I've highlighted to you all three of these people having basically the same exact take. And I think it's for different reasons, but at the same time, why do you position yourself like this? I think it's inoffensive, right? I'm never going to be as big a YouTuber as these three or like Boogie in his prime because I'm not pandering to people. I don't have the potential to even get this big because what I say, even though I don't think it is, is too controversial because I fall down on one side, right? So I'm giving you my leftist take on stuff. Most people don't like that, right? I deal with so many hate comments all the time. If I started pandering a bit more, if I made a video about iDubs like this, and I started saying, well, you know, I can see both sides. You know, what he said was wrong, but I don't think he has to apologize. I don't think Ian was a racist. It was only a minority of people who liked him and who liked the videos for being racist and stuff. Then I could potentially get a lot bigger because centrism pays, especially these guys who will start talking about political topics, but they claim they're not political at all. And that is the real like pandering that goes on for a variety of reasons, but basically boils down to all three of these people having the same take. And then once you realize they all have the same take on like one thing, you can start predicting their take on everything. So let's get into another one where these people are virtually all the same as well. And I think this topic is actually the most important one because I wanna talk about Mr. Beast. So I'm the president of the I Hate Mr. Beast Club. Probably what I'm most notorious for with people outside of like the left wing online space is being like a hater of Mr. Beast, like people are absolutely unhinged about my videos. I get so many hate comments on them, but basically, yeah, I'm a guy who hates Mr. Beast. I'm a guy who criticizes Mr. Beast a lot. Now, this was in response to Mr. Beast doing that video where he helped cure partial blindness of like 1,000 people, right? And that was when my prediction at the start of the year that people would start turning on Mr. Beast came true because there were so many viral tweets criticizing Mr. Beast of this. And even my own video talking about this, I didn't criticize him as hard as some of the other people. I just linked it to my overall criticisms of Mr. Beast. But it's part of the two main kind of like hate campaigns against Mr. Beast this year. And why I find this really interesting is these guys couldn't wait to make this video talking about how unhinged everyone was for not liking Mr. Beast. But then I find it very curious that not one of them made a video when conservatives started saying Mr. Beast was like indoctrinating children into gender ideology just for having a transgender co-host, right? And that's my problem with centrist bro YouTubers. They claim to have the moral high ground. Like, oh, how dare you? How dare you criticize Mr. Beast? He's a good guy. Cured a thousand people's blindness. How can you criticize that? You must be totally terrible if you do that. But when conservatives start coming after Mr. Beast, silence, crickets, no video, so many people made a video, so many video responded to Sunny V2's video on it. Literally every single person across YouTube was making videos on this. But now you're telling me these people suddenly added sick day? They all together decided, no, we don't wanna cover that. Let's get into this, let's start with Critical. So Critical, I've labeled Mr. Beast lawyer because whenever Mr. Beast gets criticized, out comes Critical to start defending him, start saying that 
Mr. Beast is the rich guy we've always wanted. Didn't you always want a rich guy to start exploiting poverty for content? Isn't that what we were missing in the world? Because he is exactly the kind of wealthy person people have been begging for, and he's still getting for it. It's just something that is silly and can be said for everything. Targeted at one of the only wealthy people in general who are constantly helping the community and people around him. But he's one of the only genuine wealthy people that are constantly doing everything they can to help other people. Everyone wants a wealthy person who's extremely generous to the community and doing things to help the community. And we have that with Mr. Beast and he is still getting sh for it. Blows my mind. I love Mr. Beast and his team going to Africa and filming themselves giving poor children without shoes shoes. Not that this was seen as distasteful like a decade ago with white celebrities going to African countries to exploit poverty for content. Here comes Mr. Beast's lawyer to tell us all why Mr. Beast basically can't be criticized. And the thing with Mr. Beast is he does do a lot of great his community in private. So when he does do these public displays of doing good things, I never get the impression that it's inauthentic or coming from a place of trying to, you know, capitalize on the back of suffering or anything like that. Like, of course, you can obviously tell it grows his brand, so it is mutually beneficial. Him doing good deeds does also benefit him, maybe not financially, but in terms of, like, subscribers and all of that, it does help him. But both things can be true, that he can be genuinely wanting to help people while it also helping himself. But I feel like Mr. Beast, given his track record, has shown that he does these things to hopefully inspire others, and the money he makes from this content usually goes into other things that help other people, like Mr. Beast philanthropy, for example. So it's always fueling a greater good, regardless. But something that is important to point out is that, yes, it does grow his brand. He benefits from this. Even if it's not financially, he obviously is going to take a huge net loss on this because of the price of these surgeries. His brand does grow from it. But I ask, is that a bad thing? For so long, people have called for positive role models to be the people that are successful and popular. And now you have someone like Mr. Beast, who is the biggest YouTuber, and almost all of his content is focused on improving other people's lives. Well, there's plenty to be mad about with the core problem here, which is these people should have already had access to this treatment without Mr. Beast needing to make a video on it. And I'm so f tired of hearing this term, poverty tourism tossed around when talking about Mr. Beast. It just shows such a gross misunderstanding of what that even means. To try and slap that label on what Mr. Beast does is so f off the mark. The worms in your brain must be suffering from parasites. Like, there is so much wrong in your noodle to possibly even think for a second this could be considered poverty tourism. So I was saying something at the start of the video that centrist bros will always acknowledge the opposition argument. They might even agree with some of them. But ultimately, they'll always come down on the right wing side of things or the centrist for side of things. So in this video, Critical actually has gotten better on his takes on Mr. Beast because they used to be super, super defensive, like wouldn't even hear a bad word about him. But he's admitting, yeah, this helps grow Mr. Beast's brand. But overall, it's a good thing. But then goes on to say he rejects how it's exploiting poverty for content. Now, what this is a problem to me because I, I've been a lot of videos talking about Mr. Beast and actually watching like a ton of Mr. Beast videos. It feels like his version of Mr. Beast maybe doesn't do this. But that's why I say sometimes these people remove context. So in the context of the video we just watched about the eyesight, for example, I still think that is exploiting poverty, but probably because it's in a more like clinical setting, it feels more like, oh, he's just helping people out who've been waiting for this surgery isn't that a good thing? And in a vacuum, yes, that is a good thing. A thousand people got the surgery thanks to Mr. Beast. But again, it's removing context in that this isn't the only thing Mr. Beast has ever done. Like I've made videos showing you how he does definitely exploit poverty. Like the worst one was that game show. And I constantly bring this up because I can't believe it, that this guy won a game show for a million dollars, like won a game show fair and square. And then in the last episode, they start showing you like the poverty he lives in. And I've always said like, why? why this guy won a game show you didn't give him a million dollars for free but it's to make them look better they're exploiting poverty for content and mr beast does that a lot and also the style he does it it's extremely like not tasteful at all and also links to other things mr beast seems to get a pass when other millionaires and billionaires do a lot of charity work don't get a pass and i just don't understand how the logic isn't applied to the same people and also the criticism that mr beast couldn't even exist in an equal system, I think is something to address in these videos, which to be fair, Ordinary Gamer does actually address a bit more than Critical does here. But yeah, it is exploiting poverty for content. Like in his like charity channels, 
it's literally going to Africa. It's literally going to Africa and exploiting the poverty there, like some white savior vibes. And I know it's not always Mr. Beast doing it, but it is his team. And Critical, you know, has worked with Mr. Beast. They've collabed together. He even has a burger at Mr. Beast Burger Chains. Mr. Beast has legions of rabid fans. Like the only reason my videos on him get overwhelming positive reception compared to negative is because my audience left wing, my videos appeal to left wing people. If I was critical and came out of the video that I came out about this stuff as well, I would just get absolutely destroyed by my audience because he can't have a take like that because he's cultivated a centrist audience. He has to like Mr. Beast. There is no way critical ordinary gamer or boogie ever turn on Mr. Beast because they know what it means for their audience. Now, you heard a lot of what he says. Now let's talk about Boogie as well, who basically just is a carbon copy of any centrist YouTuber. And let's listen to what Boogie has to say. But not everybody sees Mr. Beast helping a thousand people get their sight back and think that's a good thing. There are people out there who decided that this is a terrible thing somehow. It does suck we live in a society where a thousand people could see again, but the US government doesn't wanna give them the money or the help that they need to do it. But at least Mr. Beast did, right? You can't blame Mr. Beast for stepping in and fixing a thousand people's sight and saving and changing their lives for the better. You know, one thing I've noticed is all of these people that are offended for the thousand people that are in this video and are like, oh, you're exploiting handicapped people. You're, you're using them for profit. Here's the thing though. Nobody's stopping to ask the thousand people in this video. You don't see them complaining about being able to see again. So stop being offended for other people. That is more exploitive to use another person as, as a shield for you to justify your anger against a YouTuber. That's far worse than anything Jimmy's doing here or anything you're accusing him of doing. Another huge criticism was people saying that he's exploiting blind people to make a profit, but they actually have the business model that he's built turned around backwards. I believe the bulk of Jimmy's money does not come from his main channel. That's where he goes to lose money. But Beast Reacts, Mr. Beast Gaming, Mr. Beast 2, those are the channels that make him the money that he spends on the main channel videos. And actually, we know that because he said it several times. As, you know, Twitter told him that rich people should help people with their money. So uh, Mr. Beast agreed to give it all away and use his money to help people. And somehow Twitter still thinks he's bad. It's, it's just wild to me mr beast really doesn't need a legal team he should just hire centrist youtubers because they come out to his defense every time now something boogie talks about here is the business model and the thing is with this right so everyone always defends mr beast by saying he loses money on videos this has never been like actually substantiated beyond him saying it like a couple years ago like i would have a bit more respect for mr beast if he released his tax returns because there is a lot of controversy around like what he uses his money for because as we all know if you run charities in the us you can get massive tax write-offs and it's not like mr beast is above manipulating the system he literally got like a you know up to a million dollar covid loan to pay his employees and apparently he said he had 40 employees it turned out he only had nine so i'm not entirely trusting of the business model that and also boogie talking about like you know being angry for the people in the video why don't you ask them how they feel about it and you know is someone who can't see going to refuse treatment that they can't afford if someone offers it to them? What people have a problem with is like monetizing their reactions and monetizing, you know, these people's desperations and being so thankful. And it makes you look better. Like you're literally trying to find desperate people so you can get as emotional reaction as possible, which makes you look better, makes you look like the most benevolent person ever. It's just very emotionally manipulative. And again, I don't feel like you have to agree with what I'm saying here, but the, re the way they engage with the arguments is very frustrating because they acknowledge like surface level leftist arguments without getting really into it, right? Like if I was talking to Boogie right now and I was saying that stuff, he'd actually have to properly address it. He couldn't just, you know, make this leftist straw man of, we'll never ever be happy no matter what Mr. Beast does because we're terrible people and it's Twitter and we just want to be angry at people. The words coming out of these two's mouth could be interchangeable, but um, like I said, Ordinary Gamer is someone who, like I feel, has more of an ideological reason for doing this. So he made a video talking about this as well. And I actually think it was like way more fair and actually taken into account the arguments, even though I don't 
you know, agree with the conclusion, but let's have a look at it. So of course, curable blindness is a real thing. Mr. Beast obviously is a YouTuber that's built a brand around some of the most feel good content you could find. I'm not the biggest watcher in the world, I'll admit, but usually when there are people being helped or, you know, there's charities being promoted in that, I'll usually end up watching it because generally, objectively, it's a good thing to see somebody use their money for the best reasons possible. Exploiting of vulnerable, vulnerable people. Again, it's almost not even asking the people who are involved in the entire project, like, if it was okay on their behalf. I would be willing to say 100% of the people pretty much involved in that are happy with the net outcome that they have received, that they got cured for their blindness, which again, with before that, they were heavily disabled and they probably couldn't do a lot of personal things and professional things in their life. Obviously, these charity videos are a big drive to their channel and obviously all of it feed back, feeds back into one another. People are being helped from the profits generated and the revenue generated and the following generated from these videos, right? So it's, it's always something that feeds back into one another, which is generally a business model that I can actually see as reasonably sustainable for this kind of actual philanthropic ventures. People should be asking why a YouTuber even had to get involved for this to take place. Obviously, when you talk about the idea of healthcare, universal healthcare, it's a pretty political topic. I'm not too intelligent on covering the idea, but as you can imagine, being a Canadian, I have a bit of a bias myself. A few years ago, a couple years ago at this point, I remember watching Orgree's playlists on YouTube and it being so toxic that an actual appendage inside of my body blew up. My appendix blew up on me. So they took me into the hospital and the total bill I got was a whopping zero, all right? Of course, that's because I'm Canadian. Obviously for somebody who would go into the surgery in places like the United States, unfortunately, they may have to pay somewhere up to like six figure sums for that exact surgery. Honestly, for a lot of people calling this guy out on Twitter for doing this objectively good thing, should probably make it more apparent that this shouldn't have even had to happen in the first place had the governments and the people they voted for actually cared about the people you know, who they serve. So like I said, I appreciate it that he went out of his way to actually try and engage with the arguments people were making a bit more, basically acknowledging that this type of content that Mr. Beast makes, even existing, is, is pretty gross. Not gross because Mr. Beast is doing a good thing, it's gross that the system really enables this type of content that there could be like millions of people he could help out of healthcare, right? There's just so many people, especially in America and really poor countries, this shouldn't need to happen. Mr. Beast shouldn't need to do this stuff, right? And I appreciate him taking the time out to do that. But also, like I said, a lot of these people don't actually watch Mr. Beast. So he even admitted at the start, you know, I don't really watch Mr. Beast. And it's like, well, if you don't watch Mr. Beast, then I don't think you can have like a real real good take on it because you're just reacting to this one video you're reacting to what people are saying and in your head mr beast great he just cured partial blindness for a thousand people you're not engaging with the exploiting poverty argument you're not engaging with like the narcissism you're not engaging with the history of mr beast he doesn't seem like a guy who particularly loves helping people outside of making this content and everything he does in the realms of charity work is just for his image brand and just content to make money right so i feel like a lot with centrist i feel like they're just quite naive because yeah i'm a cynical guy i'm a pessimistic guy but when it comes to wealth and charity i think that's helpful because most people don't understand what people who give to charity even do like they don't understand how people use it for tax breaks. They don't understand how they use it to control their income more than you can. So when it comes to someone like Mr. Beast, who's literally one of the richest and most successful YouTubers on the platform, then you should go in with skepticism, not go in with, oh, actually the people criticizing him are unhinged. But as you have kind of got the sense of, these people are oh so moral. They're given this tape because Mr. Beast does good things and surely, as a moral person, if you're a moral person, you can agree that Mr. Beast doing this is good. That's it. Not bad at all. I'll acknowledge the nuances, but I kind of reject them. It's just good, right? So you feel like people who are so moral, they come out of the woodwork to defend Mr. Beast when everyone criticizes him, rightly or wrongly. You think they would also um, maybe, I don't know, defend Mr. Beast when conservatives start saying loads of terrible things about Chris, his co-host, who is transgender, but you guys can go ahead, type in these names and type in Chris, type in Chris, Mr. Beast, Moist Critical, Chris, Mr. Beast, Boogie, Chris, Mr. Beast, Ordinary Gamer, nothing. These guys haven't said anything about it on their main channel. And this is actually a pattern with Critical as well, because in my video I made last week, I found it really interesting how he didn't mention that a trans fan came up to iDubs and said, 
can I get a picture even though you probably hate me? Now, Ordinary Gamer did talk about this and I want to talk about their view on trans rights a bit, but Critical is a bit worse. And I actually just asked, I was like, has he even ever talked about trans rights? Because in the second video, after he'd been called out for ignoring it, he started saying, well, people have been saying, you know, I've ignored stuff, but I can't cover everything in that video. And he even referenced, you know, a fan coming up to iDubs and saying something like that, but completely removed the fact this person was transgender. And then someone um, called Tio just commented on my video today. With regard to you asking about Charlie, talking about trans people at all, as a trans now ex-viewer, I can say that I've never seen him talk about trans people at all. I never watched a stream, so maybe he did, but I only watched YouTube. He didn't talk about what happened to Chris a little while ago, and I've never seen him acknowledge us as a group. As a trans person, I got rubbed the wrong way when he didn't talk about the Chris stuff at all because it was huge and you'd expect the commentary channel to at least touch on it. I knew the bad vibes that I've been accumulating from Charlie were right on the money, even if he isn't. I don't know how factual it was, but I said someone saying he is friends with Sunny V2 in the comments of his original video on iDub's apology, which would explain a lot. Sure, it's a cool bare minimum, that he isn't being outright transphobic, but the complete lack of acknowledging that trans people even exist in any capacity is very telling to me, since it must be because he knows that his audience has transphobes in who will flock together and foam at the mouth at the mention of trans people, and it's what makes me avoid Moist now. And this person isn't wrong at all, right? So here is a clip of Moist Critical talking about the Sunny V2 video. And there is no way you can talk about this video while ignoring the fact that it's all about Chris being trans and how Sunny V2 thinks this is bad for Mr. Beast's brand, right? There's no way you can talk about that without mentioning, you know, someone in the situation is transgender, but don't worry. Critical somehow has managed to do that. So listen to this. Thoughts on the Sunny situation? Yeah, I don't know what the f*** he was thinking, honestly. He's just making it seem like how could Chris make a personal decision without consulting Mr. Beast first? Did he not care about Mr. Beast's brand image and his views? What was Chris thinking? I watched the video and that's kind of the impression I got from that. It was f weird. I felt his main point was more business side of things, not necessarily his decision. No, the... I, I'm gonna butcher like what he said at the end, but... The point was really, um, uh, Mr. Beast was able to achieve this level of success by avoiding drama like this, and now that Chris is in drama, it's affecting Mr. Beast's overall brand. Like, that's, that's a little bit of a different point. That is literally like, oh no, Mr. Beast's friend did something, and now it's affecting Mr. Beast. What was Mr. Beast's friend doing? He just treats him more like a prop for Mr. Beast. It was just weird. That whole thing was just weird. So did Chris do something bad? No. <laughs> yeah, Chris just made a, a decision for Chris and it became a huge deal and then Sonny made an absolute f stinker about it yeah it was it was f awful <laughs> I, I, I don't know what Sonny was thinking with that one that was awful that was just like actually like it, it seemed like he had a personal grudge against Chris for that one what that person said in my comments is pretty much spot on right Critical does not even want to acknowledge trans people exist Pretty much. And if that doesn't tell you he's pandering so much with his videos, I don't think anything will, right? Because a guy who literally uploads like the most low effort videos and takes every single day, not only on his main channel, but on streaming, can't talk about this stuff. And he can't talk about this stuff when he is defending Mr. Beast all the time. Like so much so I called him Mr. Beast lawyer like a year and a half ago. And here is Mr. Beast getting a ton of hate Mr. Beast even sticking up for his friend. Mr. Beast actually taking some sort of stance for once. And then Critical addresses it like that. And he only addresses it in reference to another video someone made, right? So that is your kind of centrist king right there in that he's too worried about what people will say. He can't even address this. And on that note as well, guess who made no videos on Hogwarts Legacy but did stream themselves playing it for hours? Oh yeah, Critical did as well. So he knows by positioning himself as a centrist, that he can have it all really. He can have this massive audience because if he comes out in support of trans rights more broadly, then he's gonna lose a lot of followers. But if he comes out attacking trans people and stuff like that, then he probably lose less followers to be honest because I believe most people who like his content are probably centrist or right wing. But at the same time, it's a calculation this guy is making because he doesn't wanna be controversial. He doesn't wanna be the main character. And that's why I think he responded so quickly when he suddenly did become the main character after his terrible 
iDubs take. Now, Ordinary Gamer, like I said, I respect a bit more, but it also is pretty telling. He did talk about this controversy, but he only spoke about it on his podcast, Some Ordinary Podcast, with other co-hosts. And he basically talked about, you know, the Sunny V2 drama and how it was stupid. And honestly, he's not bad on trans rights. He actually streamed with Vosh recently, and they were talking about it, talking about how crazy it was getting in America with DeSantis. And he seemed to be like totally against what Ron DeSantis has been doing. He seems more ideologically principled. But I think it's one thing saying that stuff on a Vosh stream and your podcast, and it's another making a whole video about it. Because most of his audience are never going to watch either of those, right? And most of the people who don't subscribe to him but might like his take on something to do with Mr. Beast, they're never going to see that. I respect him a bit more for actually saying some stuff about it, but I still think it's pretty telling that he never made a video on the Chris stuff and he only addressed it in a podcast with a couple other people. And I think it's extremely telling that Moy's critical. Mr. Beast's own personal defense lawyer never said anything. So if you're watching me speak right now, I chose to actually film this segment too because I'm kind of running over a bit. But I thought I'd still do this, right? So we said that Critical didn't actually make a video on Hogwarts Legacy. For some reason, this guy loves to upload every day. It seems pretty strange. He didn't have a take about the boycott. But Boogie and Ordinary Gamer both did. So let's start with Boogie because I think <laughs> this one is really weird. So basically what he did, he made a video basically kind of defending people who were going to play it. And then he got his trans friend to come on a whole separate video basically saying why it was okay to actually buy Hogwarts Legacy. Rowling absolutely has not backed down from that opinion. In fact, about a month ago, she doubled down by tweeting about a trans person who said trans people and trans supporters should not buy the game, and her basically pointing out on Twitter that she thought that was ludicrous. And of course, on top of Rowling's remarks, don't forget that Hogwarts Legacy's original lead designer used to run an anti-social justice YouTube channel. And all of this has convinced that there will be serious social messages in Hogwarts Legacy, specifically anti-woke stuff. When it comes to my personal politics, uh, if you tell me you're a woman, I'll treat you like a woman. If you tell me you're a man, I'll treat you like a man. I don't really care. Give me your pronouns, I'll use them. It doesn't really affect me personally. So I'll just, I'll just go ahead and, and treat you the way you want to be treated. That's how I would want you to treat me. For the most part, I disagree with what Rowling has to say about trans people, and I, I'd like to think I reflect that both in my personal life as well as online. But that said, I probably will still play Hogwarts Legacy if it's good. I am a cis white male, and a lot of cis white males have had a lot of things to say about Hogwarts Legacy, but instead of me putting more of that out into the world, I thought we would talk to my trans friend, Emily, and see what she has to say. Currently on the phone is my closest trans friend, uh, Swift. You may know her as Emily. I'm basically calling for permission to play Hogwarts Legacy. So, Emily, what do you think? You don't need my permission to play a freaking video game. You're an adult. If I buy you this game for $60, what harm am I doing? J.K. Rowling is known to be very uh, hateful towards trans people. Some might say transphobic. But she had nothing to do with the game. And me personally, it's like, like if I could buy it, I personally would buy it. Just play a video game. Have fun. Like, the, the whole point of video games is supposed to escape from real life bullshit and just enjoy the creation of something. Like, there you have it. It's a video game. Play it if you want to. And if you feel like you feel guilty for giving a, a potential nickel to J.K. Rowling, give a dollar to the Trevor Project and enjoy your game. So I love the part of the video where he says he hopes he like reflects in his personal life that he supports trans rights and he's just like, yeah, but I'm probably still gonna play it, right? So like, I don't even wanna get into this whole discourse again because I made two videos about it. Obviously I got a ton of hate for saying it's literally the bare minimum to just not play this game if you wanna support trans people. Like that is the hot take I had that got me so much hate. So I can imagine how terrified People like Critical were even talking about this. But anyway, it just pretty much, you know, he acknowledges JK Rowling is really bad, but ultimately sides of the right wing. Play it. It's fine. And here's my trans friend telling you that it's also fine because he probably got a bit of backlash from that as well. So yeah, this trans person tells me uh, I can play it and it's no big deal. Then therefore every trans person is okay with it. Every trans person has never said don't play this game. And also he even acknowledges that JK Rowling actually said some stuff about this boycott as well. So she knows you know, she's still making a ton of money of this stuff. Anyway, I don't want to get this into this too much. But like I said, Ordinary Gamer also didn't ignore it. But again, it plays into my problem with centrist YouTubers. If you're moist critical, you just don't talk about this because you're absolutely terrified of your own audience. Or if you're these two, 
you give the centrist take. So let's listen to Ordinary Gamer also talk about the boycott and like the reaction to this. Because J.K. Rowling uh, is an incredibly intelligent person when it comes to monetizing their franchise. Uh, this is somebody that like makes royalties off pretty much everything because she's already a billionaire, okay? She's already rich enough to the point that she can pretty much say whatever she wants and she'll never actually suffer real tangible consequences. I mean, if this game sells absolutely well, she'll maybe make a hundred million dollars more, which given at her wealth status, it's effectively a rounding error. That's how much money she's made. So of course, JK Rowling, obviously, if you can imagine, probably gives money, uh, supports a lot of organizations that the trans community would not like. So at the end of the day, the whole idea has come up that if you buy Hogwarts Legacy, you are indirectly financing, you know, uh, or let's be honest, directly financing JK Rowling in some capacity. And she can use that money that you end up giving their her to spend on, on, on something that's, you know, anti-trans, if you will, too. My take is very simple, okay? As long as you're not harming anybody, as long as you're just living life on your own terms, and as long as you're happy, who is anybody to take that from you, okay? That's pretty much what it comes down to. As long as you ain't hurting anybody, and you're doing your own thing and vibing, then I'm, I'm all on your side, bucko. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Now, of course, are you a bad person for supporting this video game? It's a reality that without or with this boycott, ultimately JK Rowling will be completely unaffected for the most part, given that the royalty she'll make will actually gloss over the fact that this will actually hurt Avalanche Software and those developers a lot more than anything else. As long as the game isn't necessarily pushing anything negative within its own storytelling, then I think it's truly safe to separate the game or the art from the artists themselves. And I've just seen more hate from every side spewed. Like literally the people that are getting like, like th th there's two camps, all right? It's either you're a bad person for playing the game or, oh hell yeah, dude, JK Rowling based, let's buy the game 10 times over, which by the way, is just as cringe, okay? Why? <laughs> just buy it once and call it a day. There's people been so like weirdly performative from every angle about this one game over a boycott that has literally only raised the attention of the game and has made it sell more copies. So I do love the centrist cop out of trying to not support transgender rights and that they're saying like, well, if you're not hurting anyone, I support that lifestyle, right? I might not actually morally agree with that, but I support, you know, as a libertarian, I support you doing you, which I feel like was the bare minimum like 15 years ago. I feel like that is a super weak kind of defense and i also think he's saying this for his main channel i think he probably actually supports transgender rights a bit more after watching his interview with vosh and stuff so like i said there's a lot of pandering going on with these centrist takes and also like i said he acknowledges you know the bad things jk rowling does but then also says you'll be hurting the development team and you know you'll be hurting them the most if you do this stuff and also ultimately you won't hurt jk rowling sales so just buy the game if you want to buy the game and also, like I said, I feel like these people missed the point because for me, I didn't think I was going to, you know, bankrupt Warner Brothers by saying don't buy the game. And I think this is something they're fundamentally missing. People were saying don't buy this game as the bare minimum of being a trans ally. Nothing to do with, you know, the sale of the game, nothing to do with Warner Brothers, nothing to do with Avalanche. I honestly don't care about them at all. For me, it was just like, you know, I saw loads of trans people like Jesse Gender saying, yeah, please don't buy this. And I'm just like, yes, I will not buy this. I mean, I wouldn't have bought it anyway because I hate J.K. Rowling personally myself because of all the far right garbage she spews. But at the same time, if I want to be a trans ally to leftist trans people, I'm just, you know, going to do the bare minimum of not buy a video game. It's really, really not hard. But I didn't really see either of these two engage with this argument, really. It was all about like, oh, well, the boycott is not going to work. So don't do it because who cares at the end of the day? And again, you can think what you want on Hogwarts Legacy, but I just think these centrist takes always avoid engaging with a lot more of the complexity of the arguments. And that's why I prefer Ordinary Gamers to the other two because I, I guess at least he tries to engage with the complexity. Although I feel like he kind of just talks himself into like what he said there. Well, both sides are bad. Like if you're buying this game to support JK Rowling, you're an idiot. If you're not buying this game, if you don't want to support J.K. Rowling, you're also an idiot and you're just performative activists and stuff like that. So I guess that's what I would be, a performative activist for not playing a Harry Potter game because of J.K. Rowling, apparently. So I hope I highlighted to you like the differences between a lot of these people and the similarities and how you can kind of spot, I wouldn't call them a grifter, but you can spot someone who's pandering very easily. And that's Boogie and Moist Critical. 
And you can just spot like a centrist who's an ideological centrist, like ordinary gamer who also does pander a little bit where he actually might hide some of his opinions for other things and be more free and open on a podcast or a live stream, but it will never feature on his main channel. And also transgender rights is something they all like to either avoid like the plague, like most critical, or they frame it in a very weird way, like they're libertarians basically. Like, I don't care if you're transgender, as long as it doesn't hurt people. I think that's pretty weak, but it's a pretty centrist take in these times because most of his audience are American. Trans rights are extremely polarizing right now, sadly. So if you want to have as big an audience as possible, that's what you got to do. And like I said, you can like these guys. I find a lot of their takes pretty inoffensive. Like if you want to watch a video where Moist Critical or Ordinary Gamer talks about Sneeko, I'm not going to tell you you're a bad person for liking that because... Yeah, centrist people can also hate terrible right-wing people as well. But what frustrates me so much about all these people and their large fan bases is, like I said, they're, you know, they're kind of like an offshoot of the anti-SJW community, but they've chosen to be centrist instead of right-wingers. And why they frustrate me is that they take a moral position. I'm not saying they present themselves as holier than thou, which I always get accused of, but I do think it's interesting how when Mr. Beast is getting criticized, for one thing, they'll defend him, Criticize for another thing. Oh, no, can't do that. It might actually make my audience mad. And also when there's a controversial issue, they never have a take. It's this side says this, this side says this, I'm kind of in the middle and maybe I kind of lean a bit right. That's my take. And hopefully it doesn't annoy anyone. Being inoffensive and pandering is great for building a YouTube channel, but at the same time, you know, people getting like political takes on certain issues or moral takes, I think it just rings a bit hollow in my opinion because like I said, the reason I respect Ordinary Gamer a tiny bit more is because I feel like it's a bit more genuine. And I feel like he is just this kind of annoying centrist in his worldview, where the other two are just frustrating because, like I said, they're probably absolutely terrified of their audience turning on them. And I always just respect people who just be like, this is my take. I don't have to pander. I don't have to run around in circles in a video talking about all sides before coming to a conclusion. I just say what I believe. And as someone who tries to be as principled as possible. You know, I don't care what people think of me, think of all the people I've criticized on my channel and all the hate I've got. You know, when I was a tiny channel, Mr. Beast, Jordan Peterson, Elon Musk, even today criticizing Mr. Beast, sometimes criticizing Hassan and stuff. I get so much backlash for that. But again, that's who I am. I'm not gonna pander just to please people. That's my personality. I've never been someone to pander at all. And that's probably why I have a particular dislike for people like Moist Critical and why I might respect others like Ordinary Gamer. And I just pity someone like Boogie, to be honest. I just pity him because like I said, although I can see elements of the pandering of Moist Critical, it just feels like this guy just doesn't have self-esteem. And just, you know, like Elon Musk, Mr. Beast, I just think he wants to be liked. So the best way to be liked is be inoffensive, centrist takes, and ultimately come down on the side that you think your audience will prefer you to come down on. Like Hogwarts Legacy, for example. Like if Boogie knew that most of his audience would boycott Hogwarts Legacy, he would say he wasn't playing it because he knows most of them will. He says he's playing it. Pretty much for these centrist bros in a nutshell. So anyway, let me know what you guys think down in the comments. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.